first up, we have Magnus Engelvall, which you can see uh, the name in the background here. Um, he's one of two founders of FlexiDrive, uh, the Sweden's first peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platform. And we're also very happy that he has a degree from Stockholm School of Economics and SSES alumni. So welcome up, Magnus. Big hand for him. <laughs> I am here to question some fundamental principles of how we organize society today. My name is Magnus Engelwall, as you heard. I have a degree from the Stockholm School of Economics and I've studied psychology at Stockholm uh, University. I am one of two, two co-founders of FlexiDrive.se, Sweden's first peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platform, enabling people to rent cars from each other so that you can rent your neighbor's car instead of renting a car from a car rental company. The topic of my talk today is a resource-based economy and I'm going to talk about that in terms of scarcity and the historical development of scarcity in different kinds of societies. And with scarcity I mean that there is a lack of something. For example, it's not enough clean water, it's a scarcity of clean water. So that's what I mean with scarcity. And I'm going to look at a historical perspective because I find that very interesting. Because what you, what you realize when you look throughout time at something is that the only constant throughout time, the only constant throughout time is change. And that's really interesting because that makes you realize that whatever we have today will not be tomorrow. It will change. The only constant is change. So if we look back at the very earlier societies, for millions of years we had hunter and gather societies. Very small, closed societies, very low on technology. It was a scarcity of real resources because it was a lack of technology. So people couldn't produce food the way they wanted to, they were moving around to different spots to be able to find food. It was scarcity of real resources because of a lack of technology. And when I talk about real resources, I mean stuff like water, wood, clean air, uh, minerals, and things like that. It was a real scarcity because of a lack of technology. Then only about 10,000 years ago or so, and that's as well pretty recent given human history, it came about the agricultural revolution, a great development in technology. We were able to cultivate earth, cultivate the lands. We could produce more food and other things. So what happens was we had a great increase in technology and a great decrease in scarcity of real resources. And at this time as well, we saw great population growth since the technology increase resulted in a decrease in scarcity. Then about 2,500 years ago came something that was completely new for humans at that time. It came an artificial resource, which was the first time we had an artificial resource. Today it's commonly known as money. And what it is, is it's an artificial resource that we come up with that the artificial resource that we came up with is symbolizes real resources because by the end of the day no one really cares about these small coins we want the real resources we can get by them so we came up with a metaphor for uh, real resources and the purpose of this if you go to economical theory is that this is a medium of exchange if I'm a fisherman, I hook up a fish. You're a lumberjack, you chop down the tree. Instead of me giving you the fish and you giving me the tree, I can come with these coins to you and say, hey, I want your tree. So what, it was a medium of exchange. So from the hunter and gather societies where if any exchanges were to take place, you exchange real resources, you get this medium of exchange through an artificial resource. So that was introduced about 2,500 years ago, a pretty new thing too. 
And now what's really interesting is what's happened over the last hundreds of years. And hundreds of years in the context of millions of years, 10,000s of years, and hundreds of years is a very short period of time where it has been such rapid development. And what has happened with this artificial resource that from the beginning was created in the form of small coins. It was used every here and there, but it wasn't that big a deal. If you look at the creation of this, the principles of how it's created today, this artificial resource, you find something really interesting. How money is created is really interesting and not very well understood, even though it's so important for us today. So money is created at the debt at all times. That means that money comes into circulation when someone agrees to take a loan. When you go to the bank and say, I want a million because I want to go and buy a house, the money is created the second you agree to pay it back. So money is always created at a debt. Someone owes it to someone else. And now, there is a tricky part here. Because the person loaning out the money to you says, yeah, here you have a million, but I want a million and 100,000 back. This is called interest that we've come up with as well rather recently. And the problem with this is that the only money that's created is the real principal. The million is created. The interest, the 100,000, doesn't exist in the money supply. So it's not created. So there is an inherent scarcity. It's an artificially created scarcity of this artificial resource that we came up with about 2,500 years ago due to the system. And this is very interesting because you, you, can, you can get the feeling that there is never enough money. No, there is never enough money. It can theoretically be enough money due to the process of which money comes into existence in the first place. Uh, so we have an artificially created scarcity of an artificial resource. And then everybody in this money supply tried to get its share of the money, so you could pay back your own debt and the interest on your own debt, even though it's built into the system that there will never be enough. So bankruptcy is built in on uh, personal levels, on corporate levels, and as well on national levels, which we're starting to see now for the first time. And this has well impact on the real resources. So if we look at society today, I would like to make two points about the real resources. First of all, we're looking at the artificially created scarcity of real resources that we have today. And let me explain this so it will be clear. If I would start a company tomorrow trying to sell air, that wouldn't go very well. Because there is no scarcity of air, at least not for now here. There is no scarcity of clean air. And when there is no scarcity at all, if you look at the price mechanism, that means that the price is zero. There is no money to be made because it's an abundance. Abundance is the opposite of scarcity. It's everywhere. So you can't make any money off of it. This is in economics called the supply and demand. If there is, a, if there is, a, if there is less supply, the price goes up. You can make more money off of it because it's scarce. So you can make money off things that are scarce. And as a result of this price mechanism, what happens is that you, you get scarcity built into the system. That you have an artificially created scarcity of real resources because that's required for the artificial resource that we came up with. So even though the technology can go on, it, and it has gone on exponential increases since the hunter and gatherer societies, technology has gone on exponential increase. We can produce so much, and we can produce so much as well that's renewable and sustainable, but we can't create abundance of it, because then we wouldn't be able to make this, uh, this artificial resource, which is scarce in itself by its creation. I hope I'm at least a little bit clear. And the second point I would like to make is that for the first time in human history, we're starting to see a real kind of scarcity of real resources given the boundaries of the planet. And that's a real scarcity. We can run out of stuff. 
that the real resources we have are scarce in themselves, given this exponential technological increase that we have got and we can produce so much. But we're focusing a lot on this artificial resource that we came up with about 2,500 years ago. So we're missing that in, great, in a great extent. So if you look at the historical development, we've gone from only focusing on real resources, exchange as well, only real resources, the limitation, the scarcity of real resources was as a result of low technology, hunter and gather societies. We have gone from that, we've gone all the way to where we are now, where we artificially create scarcity of real resources for the sake of an artificial resource that we came up with 2,500 years ago, which is inherently scarce by the way we have decided to create it. That's where we are now. And I find this development really interesting. And then the question is, all right, but how do we move on from there? And then, first of all, I think that what would be necessary to do would be to map out, all right, how much real resources are there out there? And this would be like some survey that you would map out how much forest there are, how much clean water there is, how much air there is, how much minerals there are, so we know what we would have to work with at a total. Now we don't even know that because it's for institutions who could know this, there is not a monetary incentive to give out the information and all of that. So we would need to map out what we really have. And then as a second, we need to remove artificially created scarcities. Artificially created scarcities of real resources and as well of artificial resources. And since artificial scarcities are created because of this artificial resource we come up with, we would need to remove the artificial resources that are standing in the way. And what I'm talking about here is a resource-based economy where only real resources are accounted for and artificial scarcities will be remembered as an outgrown uh, social principle which is no longer relevant for the progress of society. Thank you. <laughs>